Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We praise him for his goodness. Amen. God is good. And it doesn't change with the seasons. It doesn't change from crisis to crisis. He is good all the time. And he can be trusted all the time. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, as we prepare to share, we're just simply asking you to minister to all of us who are here and to all of those who are joining us via live stream. We really need you to speak into our lives because we really need a word right now. We need a word that's going to help us, a word that's going to undergird us, a word that is going to transition us from the old normal to the new normal. A word that's going to help us to be steady in crisis and to be a light that's shining in the darkness so that people can see, God, what you are saying and what you are doing. We lift up this time before you right now and just simply ask that you'll anoint this vessel of clay that the words that I speak may breathe life into somebody, somewhere, that your great name might be praised and glorified and honored. I lift this up before you now and simply avail myself to you. And I pray that you'll anoint the ears of every listener, and that those that hear the word will receive the word, and it will be received into good ground, so that there would be fruit that would be born from it, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him. Ha <laughs> ha. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Let me begin by saying that Jesus' entire life on earth was about ministry. I want that to just seat down in your heart for just a moment. Jesus' entire life on earth was about ministry. It was all about ministry. Everything was about ministry. Every day that he awakened, every endeavor that he undertook, every appointment that he made, and every person he took time with was about ministry. And I want to take a look at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, because it affords us an opportunity to learn a few key things about ministry that will help us as we come out of this present crisis. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And uh, as a matter of fact, we've often said this. Uh, I don't know that there's too many passages in the New Testament that are not familiar. And so it's a familiar passage and ought to be. Uh, in relationship to the, to the calling of the first disciples that he called, okay? And that's what that passage is really about. I'm going to read it in your hearing, and then we are going to take a look at, as I said, a few key things about ministry that will help us as we come out of this present crisis. Luke chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. This is what it says. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and requested of him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught or for a catch. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at your word I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish, 
and their net began to break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught or the catch of the fish which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth you shall catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. And what an important word it is in relationship to ministry. And I'm going to share uh, just a few things with you. I, I don't hope to be long with you, but I'm going to trust that the Lord will, will speak to all of us uh, through what uh, we have prepared for you today, trusting that the Lord will minister through it uh, to help each one of us. I said that Jesus' entire life was about ministry. That's what he came for. That's what he was ordained for. That's what he lived for. That's what he died for. It's about ministry. Okay? Now, this is, this is what I want to share with you uh, today about this passage. Because this passage really is about three things. It's about, one, an invitation. Uh, and if you're a note taker, write down these words. It's about an invitation. Says the porter, it's about compensation slash confirmation. And then, thirdly, it's about realization. Okay? Realization. And all three of these things are critical if, if, you, if you seek to understand something about ministry, okay? An invitation, invitation. all right? Compensation slash confirmation, and then realization. Got it? Did you write it down? Okay. Let's take a look at this from the text. And as we look at the text and begin to understand some things about the text, uh, I hope it will encourage you and strengthen you and inspire you to want to be about ministry. Okay, because as Pastor Leon has mentioned um, in the last few times that he taught and preached, uh, as we come out of this, what are we coming out to and hoping to do? Okay. Other than ministry. And if there's something else you're coming out to do other than ministry, then this time has been wasted. Got it? Got it? So let's take a look at this for just a moment. Yes, sir. Let's take a look at the first one. Jesus comes to the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gennesaret or the Sea of Tiberias. It goes by all three names, same place. And Jesus has come for a specific purpose. Let me just inject or interject this into the, into, the, into the picture. Jesus doesn't do anything coincidentally. Every step is ordered by God, and it has purpose written all over it. So if he's coming to Galilee, he has a reason for being there, and he is coming really to grant an invitation to a few of his disciples, future disciples, to join him in ministry. Now, this is what I want you to see. He is offering an invitation to participate in ministry with him. <laughs> now, when, when I think about that thought, I get a little excited, Lynette. Because Jesus never ordained that you participate in ministry by yourself. 
He is inviting you to participate in ministry with him. Man, this is, this is, this, I, hey, if I didn't say anything else today, Leon, this excites me because I know that when I do ministry with him, my ministry can be successful. My ministry can be productive. My ministry would bear fruit as long as I am doing it with him. I'm glad that we are co-laborers together with God. We are not in this on our own. You don't even have to figure it all out. You just have to make sure that you're in ministry with him. Boy, that's exciting to think about. Now, just, <laughs> thank you, Holy Spirit. Just in case you have the misconception that you are equal partners with Jesus, let me give you some help. <laughs> Amen. This is, this is not an equal partnership. You are not doing half the work, and Jesus is doing half the work. You are doing very little, and Jesus is doing just about all of it. That's why, whoa, that's why he came to live inside of us so that he could do what needs to be done. Amen. He's just asking you to let him. Amen. Now watch this. Come on now, I'm going somewhere with this, Sister Porter. I'm going somewhere with this. He comes to Simon. And, well, first of all, Simon's washing his nets. And, and he sees Jesus step into his boat. Now, you know. I want you to think about this now. Peter's a fisherman. The thing that he prized more than anything that was material was his boat. So you don't step into a fisherman's boat without the fisherman taking notice that you're stepping into his boat. Come on, somebody. It's like you are, you are cleaning the mats of your car, Leon, and you took them out and you got them on the wall right beside the car and you're starting to clean your mats and somebody comes and sits in your car you don't even know. Man, you, 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 you talking war. It's your prized possession, especially if it's new. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Yeah, watch this. Carmel, if a mosquito landed in your car, you want him out because your car is new. Let alone somebody coming and just sitting in your car. Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus entered into a ship. That was Simon's boat. That's what the scripture tells us. And then he beckoned to Simon to push the boat out in the water just a little ways so that he could teach the people. <laughs> it's like somebody come in, Leon, and ask you, hey, man, can I use your car? Your brand new car, can I use your car? You don't know me. I don't know you. What are you talking? You going to use my car? We don't do those kind of things. But the passage helps us to understand, at least in Luke, that Jesus knew these people before this time and they knew him before this time. Come on, somebody. And, and Peter is willing to do it, but watch this. This is important. Usually when Jesus calls people, he tests them. Your testing is connected Your testing is connected to what he is requesting. Watch this now. If you're not willing to allow what you think is precious to be used by Jesus, it's going to be hard for him to use you. Come on now. So he's, he's asking him, I want to use your, your boat to see whether or not you're willing to give it up. Not, not for a purpose that you're used to using it for. Because if I want to use it for what you're used to using it for, you'll try to tell me what to do. 
So I'm inviting you just to release it to me for just a moment so I can use it for what I want to use it for and I want you to trust me to do what I'm going to do with it. You will, you will find that when Jesus calls you, he tests you with what he's requesting of you. When he said to the rich young ruler, you got one thing yet that you need to take care of. I want you to sell everything you got and then come and follow me. Come on, somebody. He's giving him an invitation to come and follow, but now he's messing with the thing that's really got his heart. When he called Abraham and he finally had his son Isaac, God called him to sacrifice him. Come on now. When he, when, he, when he has the knife above him and now he's getting ready to take his life, the Bible says, God says, now I know that you will do what I'm asking you to do because you won't even withhold your only son from me. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder what he's testing you in right now. What is he calling on you for that maybe you're not quite willing to let him have without 27,000 questions you got to ask before you turn it over to him? Hmm? Gives you an invitation. And then he gets on, he, he, takes, he takes, watch this, he takes what you're willing to give up and then uses it for ministry. For ministry. Before it was just used for fishing. Or sunbathing. <laughs> no, sometimes you're out there fishing, Leon. Leon knows this. Sometimes you're out there fishing, you don't catch anything. So you're just out there sunbathing, really. You're out there getting a tan because you ain't catching nothing. Huh? But Jesus doesn't want to use it for that purpose. He wants to use it to minister to all the people that are on the shore. Because while he was on the shore, the people were pressing on him, trying to get to him and touch him. And he said, I, I just need to back off from these folks for a minute so I can actually teach them. Takes his boat out into the water. And Peter Leon has got a front row seat to hear what Jesus is sharing. Come on now. See, he gives him an invitation because he wants to connect with him and help him to get to the place where he would be able to join Jesus in ministry and be effective. Come on, somebody. So, so I was saying, I was saying that, that in relationship to what we have with Jesus, we are not equal partners. Peter... And, and whoever's with him, because there are several people in the boat, we know that by what the story says. And then later on, James and John come over and help him, but he's got some other people in the boat with him. Jesus is doing just about everything. Peter, he's just sitting there. It's his boat, but he ain't doing nothing. Come on, somebody. I'm just telling you what the truth is. It's not like Jesus is doing 50% of the stuff and Peter's doing 50% of the stuff. It is not so. He is just sitting there hearing what Jesus is teaching everybody that's gathered. And all he has done is push the boat out in the water just a little, jumped on it, and sat down. If he did anything else, he probably let an anchor out, the, out of the bow and an anchor out of the stern to keep it in place because if, if, the, if the boat has just got one anchor, it starts to shift all over the place like, like you would know if you've ever been out on a boat. The wind will blow it and then now Jesus' is back is to the people. Come on now. The current takes it and now he's telling me to shift it around. No, no. He has to have cast an anchor out the back and an anchor off of the bow to keep it in place. And he sat down. And Jesus is teaching everybody. He's not, he's not asking Peter for his opinion. Like, I just said something, taught the people. Uh, Peter, was that, was, that, was that right? No, no, no. He's not an equal partner. He's not an equal partner. This is what I want you to see. 
He's giving him an invitation to participate in ministry, but he wants him to know Jesus has got this, and he is doing the yeoman's part of the ministry. I, I don't want you to forget that. Jesus is doing the yeoman's part of the ministry or almost the totality of the ministry and he just asks you to just come along and just listen to what he's saying and do what he's telling you to do. He is not trusting you to take care of the ministry. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad. Jesus didn't just go away and just leave the ministry to us. That would have been the worst possible thing that he could have ever done. <laughs> Why? Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Jesus, Leon, is living in us and it's hard for us to accomplish ministry. Can you imagine if he just went away and left us all by ourselves to do ministry, what the ministry would look like if Jesus wasn't in us and convicting us to go ahead and keep doing ministry? So don't ever think that you're an equal partner. Remember, you're sitting on the ship. Jesus is doing all the teaching. He's doing all the ministry, and he's inviting you to learn what ministry looks like and what ministry's all about. That's what he's doing. And that is absolutely awesome that he is doing that. You ought to give him glory, thanks, and praise for what he's doing. Amen. So there's an invitation to do ministry with Jesus. To make available what you have. In doing ministry with Jesus, all he's asking you to do is make available what you have. He's not asking you to conjure up anything. He's asking you just to make available what you have. Hey, I want us, I want us to feed all these folk because they're hungry. And the next question Jesus asks is, what do you have? He's not asking them to conjure up anything. He's just asking them to present what they have. Well, we got two fish and we got five loaves. And what is that among so many people? Jesus said, come here to me. See, here we go. You're not an equal partner. All, you got, all you're doing is presenting what you have, and then he takes what you have and does something to it. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. And in some, some miraculous way, it's sufficient to minister to people. You got a boat? If he asks you for it, just give it to him. Gee, <laughs> Jesus does not ask Peter, hey, is this boat fiberglass? <laughs> the boat going to make it? No, 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 no. He's just asking you to give what you have, to make available what you have, and then he'll take care of the rest of it. See, see, it doesn't matter. Alice, it does not matter if your boat is leaking. If Jesus asks to use it, <laughs> come on, somebody. He's got it. He'll take care of it. And he'll bless the work. The, invitation, the invitation, as I said, is to do ministry with Jesus. Then to make available what you have. And then be willing to work outside of your comfort zone. Remember now, Peter is just used to fishing. This is the first time. He's ever used his boat for a purpose like this. They ain't catching no fish. They ain't even tossing out a line or a net. He's just sitting there, and Jesus is doing what he does. And now Peter recognizes, man, I'm out of my comfort zone. This is not what I do. When Jesus gives you an invitation to ministry, chances are, is not what you do. It's not how you do it. If he gives you an invitation, you may not even want to do it. Invitation to prepare you to do it. 
So, so you don't have to worry about not being skilled enough, knowledgeable enough, you know, uh, got it together enough. If he's giving you the invitation, he's already decided in his mind he's going to do what he needs to do to get you ready to accomplish what he's ordained for you to do. We oftentimes use excuses just so we can get out of it. When Jesus is telling us, none of your excuses will do because I'm going to provide what you need to have in order to do what I want you to do. Amen, somebody. Now, here we go. I said that when Jesus gives you an invitation to, to do ministry, participate in ministry with him, hmm, it's an awesome thing because you're not an equal partner. He's only asking you to do what he has ordained for you to do. Watch this. And he is going to do what he always intended to do. And you can count on it. Now watch this. This is the second thing, Leon. I'm, 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 I'm moving through this relatively quickly, but I want you to see this. What did Peter do ministry-wise while Jesus was doing what he was doing. Tell your neighbor, next to nothing. <laughs> next to nothing. Watch this, Clarence. All he really did was make available what he had that Jesus requested of him. Now, here's the big question now, Leon. What should be the compensation for doing hardly anything? Hardly anything. <laughs> right? That's right. That ought to be the compensation for doing hardly anything. You would think you'd get hardly anything. <laughs> Come on, somebody now. Watch this. <clears throat> After Jesus had finished teaching the people, he said to Simon, I want you to launch out into the deep. And I want you just to let down your nets to catch some fish. Peter said, Lord, we've been toiling all night and we haven't taken anything. We haven't caught a thing. Now watch this because you got to understand this about fishermen, about anybody that's skilled in any trade, especially if they've been doing it a long time. They figure that if you're not somebody that does what they do. You shouldn't be trying to help them <laughs> to do what they do. So if I've told you that we finish for the night, because you know how it is, you're in a spot and nothing's biting. Come on, somebody. You move to another spot and nothing's biting. You move to a third spot and nothing. Now the sun's coming up and nothing's biting. It's time to go home. And that's what they did. They fished all night. And they caught nothing. So, so, so watch this now because I've seen this. I used to work at a boat yard. And at the boatyard, we used to have fishermen. They used to go out all kinds of hours. Some, some guys would go out and fish all night. Some guys would go out 3 o'clock in the morning, and they would go out and start fishing as soon as the sun came up, and then they'd come back late in the afternoon. Sometimes they came back, they didn't catch anything. And it ain't nothing worse than when that is your living, you ain't caught nothing. So now, usually, the people just like when I worked at the boatyard, knew when the fishermen would be getting back. And the people would start to gather. When they knew that the fishermen were coming back in, they would start to gather. And the fishermen normally came in just before it got dark when people were knocking off. And the people would come straight from their job right to the dock because they knew they could buy fresh fish. 
And there were people that came in with their boats, tied them to the dock, and didn't even have to clean off their boat. Because <laughs> they didn't catch a thing. Now watch this. You got you to gotta feel me here. Because this is what they're going through. One, Leon, they're tired. Because if you've been up all night and you've been, you, you've been letting down the net, pulling it back up, pulling up the anchor, moving to another spot, lay the net down again. This wasn't some tiny little net. This was a large net. Every time they had to pull it up, it was work to pull it up, even with nothing in it. They're tired. They are despondent because they've caught nothing. And now, they ain't selling anything because they didn't catch anything. <laughs> Watch this. I'm, not, I'm trying not to be funny, but it is funny in a way. Mama is at home with the frying pan and the grease already warming. And Peter calls home and tells her, we eating chicken tonight. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Hey, we didn't catch a thing. Huh? Now, these are not novice fishermen. One thing I know about fishing, because I used to fish, I'm from an island, I, we used to fish all the time. If you go out with experienced fishermen, they know where the fish are. You know, long before they had sonar, Sonar, if you don't, if you don't understand fishing terminology, a, a sonar instrument, it actually does a, a sort of a, a um, it's some kind of a beam that it sends down to the bottom and, and, it, and it records any kind of movement to let you know fish are in the area. Some, some of the sonar will even show the fish on the screen and you can actually see that there are fish down there. Long before they had sonar, experienced fishermen knew where the fish were. Now, now this is, you got to get this now. Leland, you got to get this. They knew where the fish were because fish, like people, have certain habits. I, I don't know too much about the Sea of Galilee, but I know about Bermuda. In Bermuda, at a certain time of the year, the fish would travel. They come in from the ocean, from the, from the deep, from wherever they came from. I don't know where they came from. They might have come from Compton. I don't know. But when they got to Bermuda, they would follow Jamie the same pattern every year. They would come in at a certain place. They would stay there for a while. They would move to another place and stay there for a while. And each time they're laying seeds and, and they're, they're spawning. Amen. That's why they come in. They come in to spawn. And they move right around the whole island in certain places. And then when they get around the other side, now they go back out to sea. And the fishermen knew exactly where they would be at a certain time. Peter. And Andrew and James and John were experienced fishermen and they knew where the fish should be. <laughs> so, so when they didn't catch anything in the area where they knew they should be, it was a guess after that because they should have been there. So when Jesus told them to launch out in the deep, this is what Peter's thinking. That's where we just came from. <laughs> and we didn't catch anything. There's nothing out there. Why would we want to go back to where we just spent all night catching nothing? Watch this. Sometimes when Jesus asks you to do a thing, remember now, it's, it's linked to this whole idea of ministry and you understanding some principles about ministry that will help you. 
Because Jesus is going to ask you some things and to do some things that you won't comprehend, but he's asking you to do it anyway. So he asked them to go ahead, launch out in the deep, lower your nets. And what he's saying is, you're going to catch something. Because I want to recompense you for letting me use what you had. <laughs> now, now, this is important. This is important to get. Jesus is not like some of us. Some of us would have thrown Peter one fish and said, thank you very much for letting me use your boat. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Huh? One low, one low, and the tiniest fish we could find. <laughs> Come on, son. Man, thank you. I, th I really appreciate what you've done. Here you go. Because remember now, he didn't do much. All he did basically was let Jesus use his boat. And he wasn't working the whole time Jesus was ministering. He was just sitting down and listening. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus was paying him for listening. Come on. <laughs> Boy, what a nice job that is to have. Somebody just pay you for listening. So he goes, he said, Master, we've toiled all night, taken nothing, but, but at your word. Because he's just been listening to him teaching. He's thinking, whoa, this. This is pretty heavy. At your word, we'll let down the nets. Now watch this. This is, this, is, this is critical. Because I know this to be true because of what happens. He's doing it. Watch this now. Peter's doing it to prove him wrong. Peter's doing it to prove to him that he knows more about fishing than Jesus does. And it ain't going to be long before we're back at shore with the same we had before. And that was nothing. Leon, then all of a sudden he feels a tug on the net. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's happening here? The tug is so heavy that the net starts breaking. And it's hard for them to pull it in. The net won't start breaking unless you got something sizable in it. <laughs> so then, Lola, they become fearful that they're going to lose their compensation <laughs> for doing nothing. So they beckon to James and John who are still on the shore because they were washing out their nets to come and help them. Because what I've learned from fishing is that when one net breaks, another net has to surround that net to sort of bring in all the fish so that none are lost. Come on, somebody. Jesus wasn't just giving an invitation to Peter. He was also giving an invitation to, to, to James and John who were on the shore. And the way to get them there was to allow the net to break so that they can see what was going on. Watch this now. They come. And they quickly circle, you know, they, they're dropping in. I've seen people do this. I used to live right on the ocean. Lynette, I, I lived in a house when I was young, right on the ocean. We used to fish from our backyard and toss our line into the ocean over the wall. I used to see fishermen come with their nets, and they would, they would be following shoals of fish. I mean, thousands of fish, and I would watch them circle the fish with the net. They would drop part of the net one place, and then they'll keep dropping the net, and they circled the fish, and then they would gather the net together, and the net had weights on the bottom of it, and there was a string that closed the bottom to catch all the fish. I watched this happen. That's what's happening here. James and John are coming to assist. They're circling Peter's catch with their net just so that they can have a second net to bring all the fish in. <laughs> usually, Leon, in a boat, Clarence, I don't know if you fish a lot, but usually in a boat, a, a boat's sides are usually probably two, three feet above water. Small boats. Big boats, you know, they're much higher. But, but small fishing boats from the water level to the side of the boat is probably two and a half, three feet high. 
Clarence, they, they pull in the nets and they start filling the boats with all the fish that they caught. And now the, the boats are so weighted down with fish, the Bible says that they were getting ready to sink. I've, Leon, I've seen this. I've seen fishermen have their boats so full of fish and nets that is this much space between the side of the boat and the water now. Before it was two and a half feet, three feet. Now, if, if you just, Clarence, if you move wrong, the water starts coming in and all of a sudden you lose all your fish. The Bible says their boats were getting ready to sink because they had that much fish in them. That was the compensation for just giving Jesus what he requested, which was just their boat, which, what, oh God, which they weren't using anyway. They had already parked it for the day. Come on, somebody. We don't, we don't even want to give to Jesus what we ain't even using. I can understand that Jesus asked to use the boat and they were getting ready to go out fishing. That would have been a sacrifice. But he was asking them to use their boat and they had parked it for the day. And now watch this. They're coming in. Carefully. <laughs> Because they got so much fish in the boat. You realize how many fish are in these two boats that both of them are at the point of sinking? And this was Jesus' uh, uh, what's the word again? Compensation. This is Jesus' compensation for just taking up the invitation to join him in ministry. Now, this is what the Bible says. When Peter saw what they had taken in, he fell at the knees of Jesus and said, depart from me. I am a sinful man. Now, why would he say that? Other than because he thought he knew more than Jesus knew about fishing. And he literally decided, in his mind at least, to defy what he was saying to him. He just went, I said, he just went along with it to prove him wrong. Man. One of the, the things that we have to get about ministry with Jesus is that Jesus knows more about what you know even though you think you're an expert at what you do. It is the hardest thing to listen to somebody else tell you something about what you know so well. Because you think that you have the experience, you have the knowledge, you have the education, you have everything in place, and you know this area, this discipline so well that you ought to be able to be on the circuit teaching other people about it. And Jesus, here we go, Alice. This, this changes everything about everything. Peter saw a carpenter telling him about fishing. Peter's probably thinking, I ain't never seen this guy on a boat, let alone fishing. And here he is trying to tell us what to do in relationship to fishing. <clears throat> the, 
This is, this is awesome because I said that this is con compensation and confirmation. Okay, compensation and confirmation. It's really more about confirmation than it is about compensation. Because this is what Jesus is saying. If I am inviting you to participate in ministry with me, you can be assured that you'll always have your needs taken care of. You won't ever have to think about having anything because if you would submit to me what I'm requesting of you, you can guarantee that I'm going to take care of you. Wow. Now here we go. I'm just about done. Here's number three. What did I say number three was? Realization. Realization. <laughs> Realization. When you come to understand who is inviting you to join him in ministry and you now get the realization, the, the proper realization it will do something to you to ready you for ministry. See, as long as you see yourself as knowledgeable, as long as you see yourself as sufficient, as long as you see yourself as the teacher, as long as you see yourself as wholly competent, you're not ready for ministry. It's until you see who Jesus is and you in relationship to the light he brings and you're broken because of it. And that's what happened to Peter. He's broken through the realization of who Jesus is and who he is in the light of who Jesus is. Now he's ready for ministry. Wow, it's not about the boat, not about the compensation. It's really about the realization that if you're being granted the privilege of coming and being with Jesus in ministry, it is greater than anything you possess or anything you want to do because now you're coming to grips with who he is and who you really are. You thought you knew about fishing. Watch this. Until the one who made the fish <laughs> comes and helps you to understand something about fishing. Sometimes we get this ministry thing so mixed up. We think, we, you know, if, if we could just do this and do this and do, you know, start with the realization that you don't know much. And Jesus has invited you into this, and he wants to feed you with the knowledge that's going to take care of you in the ministry that he's calling you to. This calling that Jesus is calling us to is a different calling for each one of us. Your calling is relatively unique because you are unique. And the people that he wants you to minister to, you're the one that he knows will be more effective in ministering to them as he ministers through you. You can't compare what you do with other people. That would be wrong. All you need to do is to submit to him because he already, watch this, has the agenda already laid out. And now he's just simply asking you to submit to him what you have. We're trying, to, we're trying to qualify ourselves for ministry. You can't qualify yourself for ministry. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. How can you qualify yourself for something that you don't know you're going to be doing? I've been to seminary. It didn't qualify me. Because when I went to seminary, I didn't know who I was going to be dealing with. The books in seminary didn't have you all in it. 
You are a, you are a special bunch of people. <laughs> Come on now. Watch this. When Jesus gives you an invitation to participate in ministry with him, he already intends to qualify you. This is not a test to see if Peter is going to be in ministry. It is Jesus calling him to ministry and letting him know he's already ordained him to be in ministry. Wow, the realization. Come on now. Here we go. I'm just about done. Let me get back to my text, or at least to my notes, because we're talking about the realization. First of all, in this realization, we said Jesus knows more than you do, even in the area of your expertise. The second thing that he's trying to help Peter to understand is that brokenness is necessary for usefulness. Brokenness is useful or necessary for usefulness. So, so ministry cannot be entered into unless some things have been broken in us. Leon dealt with that just the other day so marvelously and so excellently when he talked about everything that's marring the image of Jesus in us. There are some things that have to be broken. Pride is one of them. You cannot enter ministry and be effective and be prideful. So Jesus has to, has to do some things to break it in you. And we see him breaking it in Peter. Watch this now, Alice. It's not broken once and for all. There is a, there is a starting brokenness. Because... Because we see that Peter has an ongoing issue with these kinds of problems. And at a, each place, Jesus has to break him again. Watch this now. He knows even before he calls you how many times he's going to have to break you. And he's okay with breaking you a hundred times if it means you'll be effective in ministry. He doesn't break you to destroy you. He breaks you to use you. He's at the, he's at the feet of Jesus. And he recognizes or realizes just how messed up he is. And Jesus is probably no doubt saying, we're ready now. <laughs> Class 101 is over. Because now you're right where I need you to use you. My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness, you are right where I need you now, right at my feet, confessing that you're messed up, that you don't know what you thought you knew, that I know much more than you know. You're right where I need you to be now. Now we can go forward in ministry. Watch this now. Now we're ready to go back to the shore. <laughs> Because some things had to be broken out here before you got to the people. Come on, somebody. In ministry, some things have to be broken before we get to the people. Because if they're not broken in us before we get to the people, we are going to break the people. And then we're going to be operating in grainy black and white. Because people are not going to see the Jesus in, in what is it, 4K HD? They ain't going to see Jesus that way. Come on, somebody. Watch this now. I'm, I'm just about done. Cynthia, I'm just about done. If you're keeping time, I'm just about done. Watch this now.
They get back to the shore, Leon. The boat has been touched by Jesus. They got two boat loads of fish that almost sunk the boats. And because of the realization of what just took place, they walk away from all of it. The Bible says when they got to shore, they forsook everything. And I'm thinking, what happened to all those fish? <laughs> Watch this now. They didn't even care about the fish anymore. Peter ain't caring about his boat anymore. He ain't worried about his occupation anymore. Jesus has so impacted him through the invitation that he has given that he's willing to forsake everything and follow Jesus. I guess the question that we have to ask ourselves is how much have we been impacted? Because if we're not willing to forsake anything, obviously we haven't been impacted. Jesus is calling. Granting us an invitation to come and follow him, just like with the rich young ruler. Granted him an invitation to be one of his disciples. Not the 12, but at least the extended number of the disciples. Because he said, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor and they'll come and follow me. That's an invitation to become a disciple. Watch this. But because he was in love so much with what he had, he went away sorrowful. He did not want to do what Jesus asked him to do. Watch this. He lost out. Peter just forsake everything and followed him. With a down payment of compensation. I said a down payment. Now, let me finish with this. <clears throat> Our compensation will not match our earthly effort. Amen. Oh, you didn't hear what I just said. <laughs> what we will inherit is far greater than anything we have ever worked for. I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart or the mind of people what they will receive or what God has laid up for those who love him. God's got something in store for you that you're going to get up there and say, man, what did I do to deserve this? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. All you did was give over what he asked of you. And he'll bless you for it. Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. We got to come out of this doing ministry, man. Because he's given us the invitation. He's going he's to receive what we have that we're willing to submit to him no matter how broken it looks, no matter how tattered it may be. He's simply asking you to give it up because he knows it's dear to you and it can keep you from ministry. And he's just asking you to hand it over and he'll use it. And then he'll compensate you for what you gave to him. Come on, somebody. Watch this. Way beyond what you deserve. Yeah, we're coming out, coming out of the closet. But the question is, what for? See, we're just happy to come out. <laughs> but coming out without a purpose, you might as well stay in the closet. Jesus doesn't just want you to come out. He wants you to come out different. 
so that now we can experience the new normal. And the new normal for us has to be vibrant ministry. Can't be the old normal where we just went through the motions. It's got to be the new normal where we're given over to ministry. And happy to know that Jesus is with us in it. Doing the vast majority of what needs to be done. We're just following his, his steps. Following his word. And doing what he's asked us to do. I want to pray with you. All of us need help. I'm not praying for you because you need help. I'm praying for all of us because we all need help. Father, we thank you. We thank you because you teach us and help us to understand what you're doing and why you do what you do so that we could be prepared for that which you've ordained concerning us. And sometimes that requires us yielding to you the thing that we hold so dear to our hearts so that you could use it for your purpose. We thank you for what we see in this story as you minister to Peter and help Peter to get to the realization of what you're inviting him to. And then he is prepared and ready to go forward in ministry. Ready to forsake everything and follow you. Father, we ask today, what are you calling us to specifically and uniquely because our callings are different even though generally we're called to the same thing we recognize that particularly these things are unique in relationship to the gifts that you have given us and the things that you want us to utilize we're asking for wisdom we're asking for guidance we're asking for the courage to forsake some of the things that we need to forsake and to go to some of the places that you're calling us to go. And without you helping us, God, we'll never get it accomplished. And so we lay ourselves at your feet. We recognize, God, that we're not able in and of ourselves to accomplish anything because you said without you we can do nothing. And so, God, right now in the name of Jesus, we're asking you to minister into our very hearts. Speak into our very lives. And allow us to see just how incredible this invitation is. And why we ought to take a hold of it. And just let you do what you do so incredibly. And then celebrate you. And know God that you're in charge and that you're going to take care of your people. Even though we have such a small part to do. You're going to compensate us royally. We say thank you. We give ourselves into your hands and just say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your amazing grace and love. I want to thank all of you that have joined us today, whether you're here physically or you've joined us live stream. We just want to thank you for connecting with us today and seeking to grow and to know who Jesus is and what he desires of us. That is such an awesome thing that God is making available to us in Christ. Let's take full advantage of it. Let's, let's live to the full of it that we might glorify our great King and honor His very worthy name. I'm praying that you'll have a blessed week this week and that the Lord will cause you to come into some things that are just awesome, that you'll come back and testify about what God has done in you and through you to touch the lives of other people because you've come to the realization that your life is all about ministry. Amen. That's what, that's, when we come out, we want to come out believing that, living that, understanding that, that God has let us live so that we can minister to others. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Stay safe. 
Stay prayed up. Stay alert. And listen for the voice of Jesus that is granting you an invitation to, partic to participate with him in ministry. Stand on your feet with me as we close. Jamie. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Sister Edna has sent some cake. <clears throat> For those of you that are joining us live stream, we'll email some to you. <laughs> and, 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 and those of us that are here will eat, eat what we can. Amen. Praise God. Father, we rejoice that we have had the opportunity to spend this time together. We just lift up our hands and worship you and honor you and thank you for our gathering. Now we ask that you'll go with us and keep us safe. Keep us protected. Keep us usable so that we can impact others during this crisis. That you might be honored. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are dismissed in the name of the Lord.